why did I become a meta archivist? There was something really transformative about the experience of partnering with the Internet Archive and being able to give our collection away. So for uh, 15 years, I had this collection in New York City and, you know, the world media capital in the, the wholesale meat market. And it was a fascinating room and all sorts of people came in and when they wanted footage, if they were artists or community people, you know, we would try to give it to them. And this was great. And it's amazing to be able to pull a can off the shelf and get it transferred and see what's there. But the problem was that it cost just as much money to give things away as it did to sell them. And so I didn't have a framework to open up the archives. And then this internet archive experience where um, I had the opportunity to put material online that was you know, pretty decent quality, editable quality, and give it away was completely transformative. Suddenly, um, I became a, uh, a player in kind of you know, a very public shared economy of images and sounds in history. And I began to wonder why are other archives so enclosed? What were the, um, the reasons why we just couldn't touch history, why we just couldn't touch these amazing cultural artifacts? And the problem was, you know, that you could get access to the copyrighted material, mostly you could buy a DVD, you could rent a tape, maybe you could get a bootleg, but the obscure stuff you just couldn't see. Nobody had the time or the energy or the inclination. It was just locked down tight and I began you know and I will confess that actually it made me angry I would go to these my archives conferences which you know are like family gatherings I feel quite close to a lot of these people but I would just get pissed off that these archives were closed and it inhibited me for a while I had to kind of stop going but then I realized look we really need to sort of re-thematize the way we think about these collections how can we actually share culture we can say that we should do it we can say that it's a value, but you know, an idea is nothing without its execution. And um, we needed to think about why we're enclosed and what we could do to stop being enclosed and, and build a rationale. And so I guess I became a bit of a meta archivist. And you know, then there's, there's another thread, if, if it's not too long to, to say this thing, but you know, now with the, um, uh, so I've always been interested in home movies. Home movies are cinema to me. I don't care about quote unquote real movies anymore. I mean, I love The Martian because it's pro-science, you know, but um, I, home movies are everything, you know, they're enigmatic, they're evidence, they're unpredictable, they're infinite, they're undisciplined, they're of course totally codified, they're amazing. Um, but uh, look, we need a whole kind of new strategy to deal with them because they cause everything we know about archives, everything we know about saving things, everything we know about workflow to be completely thrown out the window. And so I just got quite interested in these issues and I thought, let's try to do something. You know, moving image archives are like a really funny um, coalescence of a bunch of different ideas that don't fit very well together. So I've never tried to formulate this before, but I'm gonna to try to do it for you right now. So one of the things is just this notion that we keep archives as documentation, like as a state function. So typically, you know, in order to copyright a film, we need to know exactly what's being copyrighted. So we have to keep a copy, so that's an evidence function. And you know, that's why we keep newsreels and government films and all that, right, kind of state function. And then and there's this weird fetishism thing, you know, because movies are so primal and so powerful and because they act upon people in ways that we kind of understand but kind of don't, you know, the psychological, the erotic, the, sens the sensory um, stimulation. We want to keep this stuff, you know, and, and, and there's this kind of weird notion. And I mean, I felt this when I was into deep cinephilia, that if I had a copy of a film that I cared about, um, that there was the possibility of playing this experience back, somehow of recreating something that was very deep and, and, and primal. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons um, that people set up moving image archives, you know, and then there's all the stuff I wear saving the history of an art form and we're documenting culture, but those last two I think are kind of fringe motivations. You know, there's sort of the legal and the primal and moving image archives are caught between the legal and the primal. And so it's a very unstable place to be and it's not worked out. And as I um, said this morning, since the, uh, the, the first, um, uh, you know, modern film archives were established in the 30s. Um, 
people haven't really concocted any kind of a rationale for why we save films. I'm not saying we shouldn't. I'm saying I'd love to know why people do it. Yeah, why couldn't an archives be a place where um, not only did we come to uh, look at evidence and documents and learn about history, but also come to make things together? Um, so one extrapolation is move from the record to making. Uh, it's kind of funny now. Everybody goes to the archives and they get their cop, they get their copies, and then they go off to wherever it is they do their work, and they do it. It'd be great if some of that work could happen within the archives, and we could have you know a more um, collective sense of, of making an art product or a cultural product or doing intellectual work together. There's some reasons why that has to be solitary. Some of us are introverts some of the time, but it'd be wonderful if there was a place where this could be a the playground, you know, the skunk works. And then the next extrapolation, so that's already one extrapolation, then the next extrapolation is, you know, look, okay, so we're producing art or we're producing knowledge, why don't we produce society? Could the archives also be a place where, um, you know, you have the evidence close by and where you try to discover and arbitrate what elements of a different kind of society might be? Why can't the archives be a space for social action? So, um, an example, I mean, we kind of see a hint of this when we see people using Facebook or Twitter or YouTube to make an uprising as has you know, happened in different parts of the world. And I mean, we know the arguments why these are commercial services, they're not under people's control, it isn't true autonomy, it isn't freedom, this isn't necessarily a revolution. But on the other hand, it's a space where ideas are propagated and compared and knowledge is made and arguments happen. Um, and I'd love to think of the archives not only as a space but also as a metaphor for social change. Um, and I've, you know, this isn't just vapor. We have this library in San Francisco, which is a physical library with no media but print, and people come and they make stuff and they collaborate, and really interesting things happen. Um, a young, a group that defines themselves as a young farmers activist group called the Greenhorns, whose goal is to create five million new young farmers was in the um, library and the, the director was saying, what should I do next? And we said, make a new Farmer's Almanac. And they did. And it became a, it was born in the library and the second edition was actually edited there because they poached one of our volunteers and then subsidized him to work with us, which was really wonderful. Um, but the idea of a collection being kind of that point of irritation that causes the pearl to form, community can form around collections. And um, I'd love to think of, you know, if we think of institutions of, I don't know what civil society really means, but if we think of social institutions where things happen, why can't the archives be one of them? So in the 2000s, it became really fashionable for journalists to uh, talk about the end of analog, to preach the end of books, the end of libraries. You know, now we hear a lot about the end of film. Um, and sure, for a while, the book business wasn't doing so well. It seems to have recovered pretty nicely now. A few big box retailers went out of business, but just because we lost borders, does that mean the end of the book business? I don't think so. And in fact, I think it could be great. Um, you know, photochemical film labs are, have closed, and we don't have a reliable photochemical workflow anymore, although Kodak's making film on demand for studios to want to originate in film. But that doesn't mean film is over. Um, you know, vinyl came back. Uh, you know, um, all kinds of, of, of media forms that people said were dead revive again. Um, books are, are quite a wonderful user interface. Film that's projected, celluloid film with dynamic range and with, um, you know, imperceptible black intervals between the frames, you know, this, this is a user interface that works for a bunch of reasons. And as long as there are people that want to work with it, I think it'll be around. And plus it can be reinvented, you know? Digital is so precarious, it's so fragile. You know, we've all read the report from the Academy about how much it costs to preserve a, a, a film that exists only in digital form. It's much more expensive to keep that film alive, to keep refreshing it and migrating it to new storage carriers over time. Much more expensive than just cans of the film sitting quietly on a shelf in a cold room. Um, so we just can't be presentist about this. You know, we read something 
Uh, the internet did not change the world. The world was changing and the internet helped it change. Uh, the world changed at the same time. You know, these things make great headlines, but um, uh, film isn't dead. Analog media isn't dead. Its job is just being renegotiated. One of the things, you know, um, we find in our library actually that digital really uh, validates the analog. We use the analog books as indexes to the books that are online because it's so much easier to pull something off the shelf. And um, also a lot of our users are very young. And for them, um, books and film, physical, in their physical manifestations, are magic. They're uh, totemic. Um, they have a... a they not only have a kind of authority that comes out of their physical nature and their kind of unexpectedness, but they also um, defamiliarize. Uh, you know, you defamiliarize a movie by looking at a roll of film, you defamiliarize a text by looking at a book. It's possible to talk about history as a, uh, a, uh, a, tra a trajectory or kind of a motley procession of um, of famous moments and successes, but it's also possible to talk about history as, a, as an even motlier procession of roads not taken, of bad ideas, of mistakes, and so on. Um, I love film ephemera because it has high evidentiary value. You know, there is more evidence packed into every foot of non-theatrical, like industrial and advertising and educational film, and especially home movies, than there is in, in feature films. Um, industrial films are especially interesting because they were made specifically with, they were made to be useful, and, and more than that, quite often they were made to convince, you know, to educate. There's a tendentiousness about them, which is usually pretty up front, the message is not masked. Um, home movies, you know, I don't, how can one talk about home movies? I'm beginning to think, you know, Cory Doctorow said, let's quit talking about internet censorship. There is only censorship. The internet is ubiquitous. It's all around us. So that therefore internet censorship is censorship. And I kind of feel the same way about home movies and personal media. It's so ubiquitous that it's hard to separate those off from the world that's represented in them. And as such, um, uh, personal media is a continuum that on one end begins, I don't know, with scratches in the dirt or on the cave wall and, you know, then papyrus and shingles and clay tablets and letters and, um, uh, you know, um, quilts, for example, scrapbooks. And then at a certain point in the 20th century, home movies, home video, and now, you know, digital material in a million different flavors, and what's personal media going to be in the future? I don't know, you know, um, uh, my, the, the data trail of my Fitbit, or, uh, you know, uh, brainwave recordings. Um, but the point is, um, the importance of that is just that it's the closest we can get to documentation of everyday life. It's personal expression. I'm talking now about home movies and amateur film. Personal expression, not corporate expression. It's uniquely among uh, almost all media. Home movies are typically focused on a person or object that is loved or that is um, seen favorably. Uh, you know, people don't usually shoot home movies about people or conditions they don't like. There's some exceptions. The other thing that's interesting about home movies is their universality. I mean, and I don't mean, you know, the family of man type, this, these people speak for all of us. What I mean is that um, everything's been photographed. And, you know, you can come back to me and say, well, I don't think this has been shot very much in home movies. Might be things that aren't polite to mention, but I can assure you they have. Everything's been photographed. You know, we've got this vast body of amazing documentation, most of which has never been seen. Um, and home movies defamiliarize media. Home movies are a challenge to archives. Home movies um, are impossible to contain. Home movies are like, uh, you know, the children and the rest of the movies are the adults and that they they're like children and that they want structure they want to be regulated but ultimately they're unregulatable because you know you'll have 400 birthday parties shot by home movie makers and a lot of them will look similar because there's sort of co it's codified how you shoot a birthday party but there'll be some that don't fit the pattern and this is where you see, you know, kind of an exciting sense of invention. To me, home movies are cinema. That's all I care about, uh, film-wise. What does the trend towards people watching films digitally mean to me? Well, it's extremely convenient. Um, 
very easy to download things, although a lot of people are scared of file sharing. Um, you know, I guess, um, look, I, I always thought of movies as the glowing rectangle. Uh, and you know the job of the director is trying to, and the, and the crew, of course, is trying to pack everything into that glowing rectangle. And it was amazing, you know, you see a, a blocks long, per, you block long line of trucks parked on a street, and you know dozens or hundreds of highly paid people, and cables this thick. And the objective is to just get the right stuff inside that little glowing rectangle. Um, when you blow that glowing rectangle up to the big screen, that's something that's kind of monumental. But now the glowing rectangles got smaller. And I tend to think, and this is a little bit cranky, um, that although a lot of media that happens now on the screen is about engagement of one kind or another, I'm beginning to see the computer screen as a retreat. And I'm not saying that in a, you know, computers are bad for people Luddite kind of way. I'm just saying that the boundaries and the limitations of something that you watch on a telephone or on a tablet or a computer screen are so great uh, that um, I don't I think we've lost a sense of, you know, there being an equivalency or a trajectory from um, what a film professes to be able to do and what it actually does. I just, I don't see films acting very much on the world anymore, um, largely because of this kind of reductive frame. Um, and in addition, a lot of movies are only about other movies these days, you know, we're in the age of kind of instant uh, almost infinite referentiality where, you know, not every film is like this, of course, but so many movies are just about other movies, just like so much showbiz is about showbiz. So the self-reflexivity coupled with a small screen um, is kind of a deal breaker for me. I mean, that said, I've seen great movies, you know, I, I, um, I really like Gravity. If you take the people out of it, that's an amazing, ecstatic, well, you know, five minutes of George Clooney is like 20 minutes with anybody else. But there's something about just this sense of liberation, you know, as you're moving around doing these extravehicular trips, a bit like that way with the, the, uh, the Martian as well. I mean, I'm not just a sci-fi person, but they, were, but, but they were great. But even in those movies, there's all sorts of intertextuality. You know, there's a showbiz reference to Lord of the Rings and the Martian. Um, and I guess that's just the disease of the present.